Hey folks, I do a lot of videos on more advanced concepts, breaking down improvisations of famous players, talking music theory, interviewing my friends who are pickers, doing these transcription videos. There's one thing that other Bluetubers are doing that I don't do myself, and that is breaking down common fiddle tunes. Lots of folks have asked me to make similar content, so here we are, I'm gonna try to do it bigger and better. We're gonna learn the history of the tune, how to play the rhythm, the melody, and then we're gonna learn some common variations of that melody. This is the first episode of Fiddle Tune Favorites, where I'll teach you some of the most common fiddle tunes, sponsored by Strum Machine, but more on that later. The history of Black Ray Blossom is very interesting. The story goes that Christian Morrison learned the tune from the whistling of James Garfield, who at the time was a colonel, would become a general, and eventually the 20th president of the United States. Christian Morrison's son, Ed Morrison, would learn the tune and spread it to other fiddlers like Ed Haley and Dick Burnett. But these early versions of Black Ray Blossom don't sound much like the modern version. In fact, to differentiate, we now refer to this earlier melody as Garfield's Black Ray Blossom. It was fiddler Arthur Smith who reinvented the tune and called it by the same name. He recorded his version in 1935 backed by the Delmore brothers. This version of the tune is remarkably similar to the modern Blackberry Blossom with one difference. In the B part, the Delmore brothers accompaniment plays an E major chord and G major chord instead of an E minor chord and B7 chord. Finally, the tune would be cemented as a bluegrass standard when fiddler Tommy Jackson released a recording in the 1950s featuring the now common chords in the B part. Tommy Jackson's popularity as a session musician and Grand Ole Opry regular likely led to his recording becoming the standard version. So if you were at a bluegrass jam and someone called this song, the first thing you would want to know are the chords. Think about it. If five of us are sitting in a circle and everyone's getting a turn playing the melody, you're probably going to spend 80% of your time playing rhythm so don't skip this step. We get two chords for every measure in the A part, so if we're using boom chuck style rhythm, we're gonna get a bass note and a strum for every single chord. To practice this, we're gonna swing by our sponsor, Strum Machine's website. Now, Strum Machine is this really cool service with over a thousand backing tracks, like bluegrass and old time songs. It's kind of designed for bluegrass pickers. It's really cool. You play the backing track, you can improvise along. I love it. Today, I'm going to type in Blackberry Blossom. I'm gonna pull up the tune. And now, in my personal arrangement of Blackberry Blossom, I have some of these chords marked as dominant seventh chords. Um, so just you know, because I'm being nerdy. I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna edit this arrangement. I'm gonna click that edit button and I'm gonna change all of these chords. And while I'm doing that, I wanna let you know that uh, Strum Machine has been nice enough to offer all of you an extended 30 day free trial if you go to strummachine.com slash Marcel. So please check that out. Remember, if you're supporting sponsors, you're supporting this channel and I really appreciate it when you do that. Anyway, let's lower that tempo down to something a little more reasonable, like 85 BPMs, and let's practice those chord changes. I'm gonna show you some simple rhythm notation, and I'm gonna play along to the audio from Strum Machine. Now let's do the fun part. Here's the main melody. Now you can get this tab at lessonswithmarcel.com. It's in the tab store in the intermediate section. Now it will run you 395, but don't worry, I'm actually gonna show you the entire thing in this video today. I don't wanna put anything behind a paywall. I don't wanna hide things from you. All of the information is in this video and more. But if you want that physical copy and you wanna support me, you know, it'd be really nice if you and you know, do the thing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you get it. So let's look at this A part first. Uh, there's a ton of eighth notes and they're all played with alternating pick strokes. And alternating pick strokes doesn't mean that we just alternate back and forth no matter what. There's a system to it. The down strokes happen on down beats and the up strokes happen on up beats. So if you count in the traditional way, one and two and three and four and it's down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. 
For instance, check out this moment with a slide here at the end of the A part. The downstroke on the beginning of the measure is actually eaten by the slide. So if the slide wasn't there, we'd actually play a downstroke. But because our left hand is playing the note, in actual fact, we get two upstrokes in a row. Also, if you're not familiar with some of these things, let me point them out to you. Um, so we have repeat signs here, and you can see that we have two endings. So the first time we play through the tune, we hit the repeat sign, and we go back to the beginning, we play through, and the second time we play the second ending, and there is no repeat, so we move on to the B part. Anyway, let's play the thing. One, two, three, four. Remember, you can always hit the settings wheel down in the corner. You can go to those playback controls and you can slow this down to whatever speed you want to practice along to. Now let's look at the B part. So the B part is full of quarter notes, which means it's a lot more sparse than the A part. And the presence of quarter notes means we have a lot more notes on the downbeat. Because we have a lot of notes on the downbeat, we have a lot of downstrokes. So if you look at this passage in the beginning, we'll see we have a bunch of notes on downbeats that are all played by downstrokes. So the pick strokes are important. Don't cheat them. It's much, much easier to play this thing quickly if you have the pick strokes right. Anyway, I'm going to play the B part slowly and I'm going to count the whole time. It sounds like this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, and three, and four, and one, two, three, four, and one, and two, and three, and four, and one, two, three, four. One, two, and three, and four, and one, and two, and three, and four, and one, and two, and three, four, and one, two, three, four. One, two, and three. Remember, if the timing isn't correct, you're never going to be able to take this to a jam, so make sure you have it correct. Then we can play the whole thing together. So if we're going to talk variations, we have to understand how this tune works. So looking at the A part, we have this main melodic statement that comes up twice. And the back half of those lines function either as this turnaround phrase that gets us back into the melodic statement or as a tag, which feels much more like a conclusion. Now, generally, the turnaround and the tag tend to be less agreed upon. We see more variation in arrangements here. And the main melodic statement tends to be more agreed upon, even though they still might be a little bit different. They're all very, very similar. Let's talk about that main melodic statement. There's two ways to play it. The way I've already shown you. And then with the two interior notes of each group of four eighth notes flipped. You can see they are very similar and get the same point across, but are markedly different at their core. You can also find versions of this statement that strip out some of the eighth notes, leaving the melody feeling less busy. Also, worth noting that sometimes people will play some variation of this melody up the neck, either like this,
like this. Or even like this. Moving on to the turnaround section, the original phrase sounded like this. Some folks strip some eighth notes, and instead of playing chromatically over the A7 and D7 chords, they play arpeggios. Remember, I said the turnaround and the tag are much less agreed upon, though, so it's not uncommon to see completely alternate lines. A good example would be this one. Others stretch the line upwards in order to catch the C-sharp on the B string to acknowledge the A major chord or A7 chord. That might sound something like this. <music> Lastly, the tag at the end of the A part is where we will see the biggest differences from arrangement to arrangement. The phrase I initially showed you hints at the Lester flat G run and is something I borrowed from Jake Workman. It sounds like this. <music> There is certainly room for a more traditional sounding phrase though. Another traditional phrase that you might hear is this. Since tags are such a good place to hear personal language, you can also find people slipping in hot language, things like this. So if we want to talk variations for the B part, that's going to take some knowledge as well. So I view the B part slightly differently. I look at it as alternating measures of either static, relatively stationary phrases that describe the current chord, and movement, linear lines that have a flowing purpose, whether it be descending or ascending, what have you. Um, so of course, the, the end of the B part is a tag again as well. Let's talk about the first two measures of static and motion. I wrote them like this. Some people add an extra eighth note to the static measures. This hides that static feeling a little bit. Others take this line an octave down so it feels more like a funk bass line. Some folks might leave the line as is and strip out a few eighth notes from our movement measure. The next two measures have us contending with a B7 chord. Our original line was this. Now there's definitely a more traditional line hidden in here. That traditional phrase dropped an octave sounds great too. Another way to imply the B7 chord without having to work too hard is by playing a descending line starting on F sharp. Looking at the ending tag in the B part, the initial one I presented you with was a more traditional example. Some folks reverse the two highest notes in this tag to give it a slightly different feeling. I've also certainly heard people pull off some sneaky phrasing to get in other traditional tags too, though. For the folks that end up playing things down the octave, you can do that too. So I've given you an example of varying every single measure of the tune. And that's important to us because learning and creating these variations means that you're playing an original, unique version of the tune. And that is part of what keeps bluegrass a living, breathing tradition. And guess what? The variations that I showed you today are just barely scratching the surface. In fact, I would call most of them commonplace. I bet you can find my alternate phrases or variations of them in every single arrangement of Blackberry Blossom that's available online right now. So now it's time for you to make your own. I want you to interact with the tradition. In fact, if you uh, come up with a cool variation of the melody, if there's part of it you have a, a smart twist on, post it on Instagram, tag me in it.
I'd love to see it. A big thank you to Strum Machine for making this video happen. Remember, if you go to strummachine.com slash Marcel, you can get extended 30 day free trial of their product. Backing tracks are just such a great way to learn and their service is really top notch. Otherwise, I wouldn't be working with them. Also, remember you can get the tab for my straight ahead arrangement of Blackberry Blossom. I've already shown you all of it and more, but if you want that physical copy just to print out, take notes, do all of that, I'd really appreciate it. That's lessonswithmarcel.com. It's in the tab store. I believe it's in the intermediate section. Uh, so like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you all later.